will uh, present to you the uh, ministerial starting tomorrow, and then uh, he'll be here to take your questions. Secretary General. Good morning. Um, this week, NATO defense uh, ministers will take decisions to continue modernizing our uh, alliance to ensure uh, our deterrence and defense uh, remains effective. We need to keep investing in our uh, security. So we will address our progress on uh, burden sharing. Today, we are releasing for the first time figures for 2019 defense spending. And I can announce that the real increase for 2019 is 3.9% uh, across European allies and uh, Canada. So we now have um, five consecutive years of growth uh, in defense uh, spending. By the end of next year, European allies and Canada will have added a cumulative total of well over uh, $100 billion uh, uh, since 2016. And as you can see, more allies are reaching our goal of spending 2% of GDP on defense. This year, we expect eight allies to spend at least 2% of GDP on defense, up from just three allies in 2014. This is a good trend, and we expect this to continue. The majority of allies have plans to reach 2% by 2024. In this slide, you see the increase for each individual ally. When you look at the percentages, most allies have increased their defense spending by double digits uh, since 2014. You have all the details in the press release. <clears throat> we are also investing in more new capabilities. This year, 16 allies are expected to meet a benchmark of at least 20% of defense spending devoted to major equipment. Almost all allies have plans to do so by 2024. And allies are stepping up with more forces for NATO missions and operations. This uh, is impressive progress and a sign of commitment. So NATO is on the right track. But we must keep up the po positive momentum. We will also address Russia's continuing violation of the INF Treaty. Russia has until the 2nd of August to verifiably destroy its SSC-8 missiles, which violate the treaty. The United States and other allies have tried to engage with Russia about their new missile system for years, including in the NATO-Russia Council. We are planning uh, to hold a meeting of the NATO-Russia Council next week to raise the issue again. We call on Russia to take the responsible path. But unfortunately, we have seen no indication that Russia intends to do so. In fact, it continues to develop and field the new missiles. And there are just uh, five weeks left for Russia to save the treaty. So tomorrow we will decide on NATO's next steps in the event um, Russia does not comply. Our response will be defensive, measured, and coordinated. We will not mirror uh, what Russia does. We do not intend to deploy new land-based nuclear missiles in Europe. We do not want a new arms race. But as uh, uh, Russia uh, is deploying new missiles, we must ensure that our deterrence and defense remains credible and effective this is NATO's job. Effective deterrence and defense also means staying ahead of the technolo technological curve, including artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and next generation communications. So ministers will discuss how NATO's uh, defense planning process will be used to ensure allies are investing in new technologies, how joint capability development provides access to cutting edge capabilities 
which individual allies could not afford alone, like next generation NATO surveillance drones and planes, and how NATO sets standards to ensure our forces can operate seamlessly together. We are also updating our guidelines for resilient infrastructure, including telecommunications. We will be joined uh, by our partners Finland and Sweden, as well as EU High Representative Mogherini, because these technologies raise challenges and opportunities for us all, and this could be a promising uh, area uh, for future NATO-EU cooperation. Ministers will also uh, approve NATO's first uh, uh, ever space policy, creating a framework for how NATO should deal with opportunities and challenges in space for alliance security and operations. Space is part of our daily lives, and while it can be used for peaceful purposes, it can also be used for aggression. Satellites can be jammed, hacked, or weaponized. Anti-satellite uh, weapons could cripple communications. So it is important that uh, we are uh, vigilant and resilient also in space. NATO can serve as a key forum, bringing allies together to share capabilities and information. <clears throat> Afghanistan will also be an important point on our agenda, with a meeting of all nations contributing to our training mission. While the security situation remains serious, we see a unique opportunity for peace. Allies fully support U.S. efforts to reach a peaceful settlement in Afghanistan, and our continued commitment, both with forces and funding, is key to creating the conditions for peace. Finally, we will host a meeting on the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. The coalition has made remarkable progress retaking all the territory once held by ISIS terrorists. Now we must ensure that they do not come back. That is why NATO's training mission in Iraq is so important and why we will continue our efforts together with allies and partners in the global coalition. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. <clears throat> okay, uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Financial Times over there. Up there, please. Yep. Blue suit. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Peel, Financial Times. Uh, Secretary General, could you tell us uh, some more, please, about what responses are being considered uh, if Russia does not come into compliance with the INF by August the 2nd? In more detail, what some of these would be, please. Thank you. So I will not uh, preempt the outcome of the ministerial that starts uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, but of course we need to respond if Russia does not come back into compliance with the INF uh, treaty, and uh, uh, the defence ministers uh, will discuss measures on uh, 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 when it comes to how NATO uh, will respond if Russia uh, does not come back into uh, compliance. Uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, the uh, deployment of the Russian missiles, the SSC-8, is something we have uh, been uh, concerned about for several years. We have seen the deployment over, taking place over several years. Uh, the, the concerns about the new Russian missile uh, was first raised by the Obama administration. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, it was also actually addressed at the NATO summit uh, in Wales in 2014. Uh, so this is not something that uh, surprises us. This is something we have seen uh, developing over years, and it's part of a pattern uh, of uh, uh, increased Russian investments in military capabilities close to our borders. And therefore, NATO has already started uh, the... Uh, to adapt and to respond uh, to this pattern of Russian behavior uh, by, for instance, increasing re the readiness of forces, by uh, deploying forces to the eastern part of the alliance. So uh, we have already started an adaptation to a more assertive Russian behavior. Okay, we'll go to the front row here, please. Well, thank you very much. I'm Professor Anyar from Ariana News. 
If the peace agreement achieved in Afghanistan, will NATO continue its financial and military commitments beyond 2021? So first of all, we are strongly uh, supportive of the peace uh, efforts uh, and all allies support them and we are in close consultations with uh, the US uh, uh, chief negotiator, Ambassador Khalisad. He has been here several times uh, consulting and briefing allies and, uh, and this will also be an issue we discuss at the meeting that starts uh, tomorrow. Um, allies are uh, uh, committed to support the peace process uh, partly by uh, continuing to provide support to the Afghan uh, uh, forces, our train assist and advice um, mission, because we strongly believe that uh, uh, a Taliban has to understand that they will not win on the battlefield, uh, and that's, and that's uh, 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 important to create the conditions for a, a peaceful, negotiated political uh, solution. So that therefore we will uh, continue to provide support. Um, uh, we will also uh, continue to provide uh, financial support, and allies have committed to provide uh, continued financial support uh, until 2024. Then, of course, the, the presence of NATO troops uh, in Afghanistan after the peace deal uh, will, of course, depend on the content of the deal. Uh, 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 so, uh, but I think it's a bit too early to speculate exactly on what kind of presence uh, we will have after a potential deal because we haven't seen the content of the deal uh, yet. James? Yeah. Uh, yes, Brooks Senior James, Defense Weekly. I'd like to come back to the INF. Uh, whatever options you, you install, and I can only see three, either an extension and reinforcement of the U.S. nuclear umbrella or nuclear missiles in the air on airplanes or a, a, a European missile defense system. These are all expensive options. Regardless of which one you choose, do you foresee any major impact on defense spending and on the budget of NATO as a result of the options you do choose? <coughs> Thank you. Again, uh, it, it's absolutely fair to ask questions about what measures uh, NATO will undertake if Russia doesn't come back into compliance. Uh, but I will not uh, now uh, tell you what uh, ambassadors, uh, or now what the ministers will uh, decide and discuss uh, tomorrow and the day after uh, tomorrow. I think we have to uh, first have the meeting and then, and then uh, uh, tell you what we uh, uh, decided and discussed during uh, that uh, meeting. Um, uh, um, uh, but of course, uh, and our focus now is to continue to call on Russia to come back into compliance. They still have time, uh, five weeks. Uh, uh, time is running out, but Russia still have, has time to come back into compliance and to uh, 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 respect the, uh, the INF uh, treaty. Uh, as I said, the deployment of the new SSC-8 missiles is something that has taken place over years. Uh, and it's part of a broader pattern of Russia's uh, uh, moderni uh, modernization of its forces. And NATO is responding already to this uh, pattern of Russian behavior uh, part of that is high redness, uh, increased presence of our forces in the eastern part of the alliance, and increased defense spending. So we are increasing the spending, we will increase the defense spending, and this will enable us to invest in new capabilities, to strengthen our deterrence and defense, uh, also in response uh, to uh, a Russian violation uh, or continued Russian violation of the INF Treaty. Deutsche Welle. Over there, no? Lady over there. Hi, Terry Schultz with Deutsche Welle and NPR. Um, I understand that Iran is not a NATO issue, but are you concerned that the tensions in the Gulf will spill over and become a NATO issue? You have um, the United States on one side, and I understand that uh, Acting Defense Secretary um, Esper is planning to raise it here at the meeting. Um, do you expect that? And, and <clears throat> is this another, another issue where the Europeans and the U.S are on different sides, um, and <coughs> how concerned are you about both the actual situation on the ground and the situation it creates within NATO? Thanks. So we are concerned about the situation in the Gulf, uh, and uh, we are also concerned about uh, Iran's uh, destabilizing activities in the region, its support for terrorist uh, groups, its, uh, its uh, uh, missile program, and also the announcement that Iran will uh, uh, restart the enrichment of uh, uranium, and all allies share these concerns. 
Uh, so, uh, so that's also, I think that uh, we welcome the fact that um, even though Iran is not uh, formally on the agenda for the defense ministerial meeting, uh, I expect that Iran will be discussed uh, both in the meeting and uh, uh, in different bilateral meetings that takes uh, place on the margins of the defense ministerial meeting. And I also expect that um, uh, Defense Secretary Esper will brief allies. Uh, and I think this is useful because uh, then NATO uh, is a platform uh, for uh, NATO allies and ministers to exchange views, to ex exchange analysis about the challenges we all face uh, in the Gulf. Our Russian colleague of the <coughs> third, third row, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mikhail Karostik of Commerçant uh, Daily Russia. You said that uh, next week we will see a new Russia-NATO meeting. And I would like to ask you, uh, do you expect any new announcements, any new developments, or will it be just a statement of already known positions? Thank you. So I strongly believe in dialogue, uh, and I uh, especially believe it is important to have dialogue when the situation and relations are uh, difficult. And, and there is no way to hide that the relationship between NATO and Russia is more difficult now than it was uh, not so many years ago. Um, uh, but the NATO-Russia Council is an all-weather council, it's an all-weather institution that uh, facilitates dialogue between NATO and uh, NATO allies and, uh, and Russia. And, uh, and I really hope and I expect that we will have an open, we will have a frank, we will have a real discussion about uh, the INF issue. Uh, I expect, of course, NATO allies to uh, raise their concerns about the Russian uh, violation, uh, violations, but also make clear that if NATO, if, if Russia doesn't come back into compliance with, uh, with uh, the treaty, uh, NATO has to respond. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, we will respond in a defensive and measured way, uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we uh, deliver credible uh, deterrence and defense also in a world without uh, the INF Treaty and with more Russian missiles. Washington Post, yeah. <coughs> Washington Post over there, and then we'll go to AFP. Yeah. Thank you, Michael Birnbaum from the Washington Post. Um, <clears throat> a question about Iran again. Um, did President Trump warn you last week that he was considering airstrikes against Iran? Um, and you mentioned Iran's destabilizing activities within the Persian Gulf region. Um, how would you characterize U.S. actions in the region right now? Thank you. So we, in NATO, uh, we exchange uh, analysis, assessments uh, on a regular basis about uh, many different uh, issues, so including, of course, uh, about the situation uh, in the Gulf uh, and Iran. Uh, I cannot, I can, uh, it's not right if I go into the specific, uh, specifics of these ongoing consultations and exchange of information. We, for instance, share intelligence. Uh, that's one of the most important thing, uh, things our new intelligence division uh, uh, does is actually to make sure that we share intelligence uh, also on the situation in uh, the, uh, uh, the Gulf. Um, uh, but as you, as you know, um, uh, NATO as, as an alliance is not directly involved in the current situation in the Gulf. Some NATO allies uh, are. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the important thing now is to uh, reduce tensions, uh, and I welcome the fact that the United States so clearly has stated that they are ready to sit down and talk uh, with uh, uh, Iran uh, to reduce tensions and to uh, avoid uh, any miscalculations that can create really dangerous uh, situations. Agence France Presse. Yeah. Uh, hi, Damon Wick, uh, AFP. Um, just going back to the um, space issue that you mentioned earlier, uh, do you foresee uh, further down the line that Article 5 could apply to a space situation? The important thing uh, of the decision uh, ministers will make uh, during this ministerial meeting on space is that we create the framework. Uh, a NATO framework for how to address challenges in the space, the opportunities and, and the challenge, cha challenges. And then we will build different elements and make uh, uh, decisions uh, strengthening our space policy in the coming months and, uh, and years. Of course, NATO allies have addressed the challenges in space for years. 
We have uh, satellites, there are uh, uh, what's uh, in, in space, we have satellites and, and cap capabilities which are important for navigation, for command and control, for communications, for tracking incoming uh, missiles, uh, missiles attacks and so on. So space is already very important for NATO allies, but the new thing we do today or at the meeting tomorrow uh, uh, and the day after tomorrow is to agree, a, a join the common NATO framework on how to address the opportunities and the challenges in space. Therefore, I think it's too early to uh, speculate about all the different elements, including uh, 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 how we will address the issue of Article 5. Okay. Wall Street Journal. Yeah, gentleman in the light suit. Yeah. Thank you. James Marson, Wall Street Journal. Um, US officials have been quite vocal recently, uh, raising concerns about um, the European Defence Fund and PESCO uh, around questions such as interoperability, access and so on. Um, these are initiatives that you've welcomed in the past. Uh, do you think the US criticism is justified? I strongly believe that EU efforts on defence, uh, including PESCO and the European uh, Defence Fund, uh, can help to improve burden sharing between uh, Europe uh, and uh, the United States. Uh, uh, as long as this in done, is done in a way which uh, complement uh, uh, and, uh, and don't uh, compete with uh, uh, NATO. And, uh, and it has been clearly stated from European leaders again and again that these efforts are there to complement and not to compete, not to be a, a, an alternative uh, to NATO. Then we have a close dialogue, uh, NATO and EU, but also between uh, NATO allies like the United States and, uh, and the EU. Uh, on the details on how these different instruments are uh, going to be uh, um, developed and, uh, and established and, and some of the details are uh, yet to be uh, decided. Uh, because it is important that these new instruments, as a PESCO and the European Defence Fund, that they don't create new barriers between uh, our defence industries. We have to work together, and not least to address the, te the technological challenges we are faced with. Uh, so we welcome EU efforts uh, as long as they strengthen the European pillar uh, within uh, NATO and not create any new barriers or, or, or establish any alternative uh, uh, competing uh, structures. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, that dialogue continues. Okay, we'll go to the front row, gentleman with the brown jacket. Thanks. Thank you. Khushnut Nabizada from Afghan Media Khama Press. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, as you're aware, Taliban have said and warned Afghan media that within one week, if they do not stop any advertisements and media programs that support the military operations and the military achievements, uh, they can be targeted. What's NATO's stance and reaction towards it? We strongly condemn any threat against uh, any uh, journalist uh, because it is uh, absolutely uh, fundamental democratic right to have freedom of press for journalists to, to work, to do their work and to report and write about uh, what they want in the way they want. That's, that's a really a core democratic uh, value and, 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 and the democracy, the rule of law are uh, fundamental values uh, for uh, uh, NATO. And we have seen that journalists have been killed in Afghanistan but also in other countries and it is extremely important to stand up for their right to, to to report, to work, uh, because that is so important for uh, our uh, uh, efforts to strengthen democracy and the rule of law. Europa Press. Um, thank you, Secretary General. Anna Pisanova from the Spanish news agency, Europa Press. Um, after decisions tomorrow on the INF, how quickly do you think that we'll see these being implemented? Um, particularly, I don't know, of a more con conventional or military nature, uh, will they be straight away um, rolled out uh, from the 2nd of August, uh, or do you think that, that, that it would be a more scaled out uh, deployment? Thank you. Again, um, first of all, uh, we still call on Russia to come back in, into compliance. There is still a, a window of, of opportunity. It's getting smaller and smaller. Uh, but uh, uh, until the 2nd of August, uh, Russia still has the opportunity to save the INF Treaty. And if the uh, uh, treaty uh, breaks down, uh, uh, then uh, the responsibility lies solely with Russia because they have now violated the treaty for several years. Um, we will 
I expect us to agree on different uh, 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 measures. So therefore, uh, some we can implement quite uh, quickly, others will take more uh, time. Uh, and as I also highlighted uh, uh, earlier, or, uh, is that NATO has already started to adapt uh, to the fact that, that uh, Russia is investing more in nuclear capabilities, different kinds of nuclear capabilities, including those who are violating the INF Treaty. Uh, and uh, and uh, the biggest adaptation of our alliance, uh, the most significant uh, reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War, is taking place now. Uh, and we see that also with the increased defense spending, because it is, it will not uh, it, 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 it is not free, it has a cost to strengthen our collective defense, and, uh, and uh, that's uh, also one of the reasons why, and that's the main, that's the reason why we're increasing defense spending, and also why the figures I published today, or we published today, are so important, because they show that NATO allies have the uh, will, uh, the strength, and the commitment to live up to their uh, uh, promises on defense spending. Okay, we'll go to the lady in the back there, yeah. It's Dorota from um, Polish TV, Polsat. Uh, Secretary General, you are in the process of uh, designating your deputy. Uh, I would like to know which criteria are you taking into consideration in this process? When will we know the final decision? And what do you think about the Polish uh, candidate, Krzysztof Szczerski, the presidential minister? Apparently, he has an unofficial uh, backing of the Americans. So we are uh, uh, in the process, or I'm in the process of appointing a new uh, Deputy Secretary General. That is an important uh, position. It's, a, it's, of course, a person that works very closely with uh, me. Uh, and it's a merit-based process. Uh, and uh, I welcome the fact that uh, uh, there are different uh, highly qualified uh, candidates. But I think it's uh, wrong if I now start to go into the details of that uh, process. It's, it will be a merit-based process. And I welcome the fact that we have several good uh, candidates. Tas. Thank you very much, TAS News Agency, Tenius Dubrovin. Secretary General, a follow-up to James' question about the uh, uh, defense spending and the INF Treaty, as uh, Russia has already uh, claimed that uh, it has never violated this treaty, it will not uh, ha do anything to return to it. So uh, when uh, the, the time came, uh, come to uh, take measures uh, of preparing to the world without uh, INF Treaty. Uh, do you expect that uh, the uh, defense spending uh, will, uh, will rise even higher, uh, much more than 2% that the NATO countries uh, have to pay now? And my question uh, about the cyber defense. Do you plan to discuss at the uh, NRC Council the, uh, next week uh, the information about uh, US uh, hacker attacks uh, against Russia, uh, according to the uh, statement uh, by uh, New York Times? Uh, our, uh, United States uh, has infected Russian energy systems with uh, malware uh, programs. So uh, do you plan to discuss uh, what uh, maybe the Russian answer on how to avoid it. Thank you very much. There is no doubt that Russia is violating the INF uh, Treaty. And uh, this is something which was then raised by the Obama administration several years ago. Uh, and in the beginning, Russia denied the existence of the SSC-8 missile. Uh, after some years, they actually uh, uh, accepted that the missile uh, existed. But then they're trying to deny uh, the, that the range violated the, uh, the INF Treaty. But again, um, all allies agree that Russia is in violation. Several allies has, have independently, based on their own intelligence, assessed that Russia is in clear violation of the treaty. And Russia has not answered our questions and not in a verifiable way, uh, and transparent way, uh, shown that they are in, uh, in compliance with the treaty. So, so uh, NATO has shown, and NATO allies have shown uh, patience, uh, and we have actually used years to try to get Russia back into compliance before we did anything. Um, so uh, I think the fact that all allies uh, agree that uh, now the time has come uh, to uh, 
uh, tell the Russians that if they don't come back in, in, into compli compliance, then we don't have any INF treaty anymore, because uh, a, a arms control treaty doesn't work if it's only respected by one uh, side. And, and it is a strong signal of unity that all allies agree with the US, both on the assessment that Russia is in violation and on the decision to start the withdrawal uh, process uh, that ends on the 2nd of August, unless Russia comes back into uh, uh, verifiable uh, uh, compliance. So, so that, that's no doubt that Russia is violating this cornerstone uh, uh, arms control agreement, which has served all so well for uh, many decades. Russia still has the chance to come back into compliance, uh, uh, but of course the likelihood of that uh, uh, to happen diminishes every day because uh, time is running out. Uh, then, uh, so one of the reasons why we made the pledge uh, to increase defense spending in 2014 after years of cutting defense spending across uh, NATO was, of course, uh, a more assertive Russia, which already had started uh, to deploy the SSC-8 uh, uh, the, as a dual-capable, nuclear-capable uh, uh, missile, but also uh, uh, many other uh, decisions and actions by Russia to strengthen its conventional and nuclear capabilities. Um, so yes, part of the reason why we are increasing defense spending is to provide the necessary uh, funds for us responding uh, to the SS8, SSC-8 missile, the Russian SSC-8 missile, uh, and, the, and the pattern of Russian behavior, which we have seen over uh, several uh, years. Um, uh, um, I think that the NATO-Russia Council is important also because if any ally or, any, or Russia has anything to, uh, to raise with the NATO allies, then, then they can raise it. And, and, and that's the reason why we have the, um, uh, uh, the NATO-Russia uh, Council. And that's also the reason why I welcome the fact that we can have open and frank uh, uh, discussions. We'll go to the gentleman in the second row with the blue shirt. Uh, Bobby Christa from Telma Televizia, North Macedonia, Mr. Secretary General. Which is your assessment about the uh, process of uh, ratification of accession protocol of North Macedonia, <coughs> which is uh, going very fast comparing uh, with uh, other countries? What is according to you the reason? And uh, is it possible for North Macedonia to become the 30 member state till uh, uh, summit in December? And uh, what are the major uh, challenges uh, both from military and political aspect in this uh, ongoing process. Thank you. The NATO enlargement uh, is a great success story. It has helped to uh, spread democracy, stability, prosperity across uh, Europe. And now the latest uh, new member will be uh, uh, North Macedonia. Uh, all allies signed the accession protocol. Uh, 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 when was that? Uh, last spring? No. no. No, in February, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and in, in, in February, and then, uh, and then the ratification process has, uh, ha, has now started. And as you say, the ratification process goes uh, quite fast. Uh, normally, uh, at least last time when Montenegro joined, it took uh, one year. Uh, therefore, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not able, and, and it's not up to me, it's up to the 28 national parliaments to decide how fast they can ratify the accession protocol. It will be great if all could finish by December when we have the leaders' meeting uh, of NATO in London in December. Uh, uh, but if not, I expect that to happen uh, soon after. So uh, uh, North Macedonia is on the track to be a full member. Uh, North Macedonia uh, meets the NATO standards. And just the fact that uh, we now can agree uh, on, on having uh, North Macedonia as our 30th member um, reflects the fact that, that uh, uh, the big name issue, or the big difficult name issue, has been solved, and that's very much because of, though that's because of the courage shown by the two political uh, leaders, uh, Prime Minister Tsipras and uh, Prime Minister uh, Saev uh, in, in, in Skopje and Athens. Okay, and we'll go to the gentleman over there. Uh, Milo Šudović, uh, Daily Vijesti, Montenegro. Uh, NATO recently decided to donate a three-day radar to Montenegro. So what it means for NATO to help member states with, equi with the equipment, especially smaller member states like Montenegro? Thank you. 
NATO is about solidarity. NATO is about that we protect and defend each other, we help each other. Uh, so uh, I think the new NATO radar or the radar we provide to Montenegro shows that we actually help each other uh, uh, and, uh, and that's the reason, especially for smaller countries, to be part of NATO, because then you're part of a family, you're part of an organization uh, where we uh, support and help uh, each other. That, uh, that is important for Montenegro, but it's for, important for all NATO allies. But it's not only small NATO allies that uh, receive uh, help. Uh, for instance, we now have a big uh, NATO investment, uh, several hundred, a uh, couple of hundred uh, US dollars uh, for infrastructure uh, in Poland to facilitate more U.S. equipment in Poland. So it just shows that NATO provides help, invest in infrastructure in many different NATO allied countries, and all of this is good for uh, the whole alliance. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, Alf Johnson from the VG Norwegian Daily. Good morning. Uh, on the, if I may ask you, on the NATO readiness initiative, the four times 30, that is going to be uh, up and standing next year. Uh, if you can give us the status on the fourth generation, since we know that <coughs> excuse me, uh, certain countries will not be able to reach the threshold of the NATO expectations. Thank you. So we are on good track to uh, meet uh, the pledge we made uh, to have uh, 30 battalions, uh, 30 air squadrons, and, uh, and, uh, and 30 uh, combat ships uh, 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 ready within uh, 30 uh, days uh, um, uh, at, by the end of the, this year or beginning of the next year. And, uh, and this is extremely important because uh, a very important element in our response to a more unpredictable uh, world, uh, to more threats and challenges in the South, uh, with a more sort of Russia, in, 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 in cyber, with new technologies, uh, is to is to have a high readiness of our forces, to create a culture of, of readiness, to have uh, forces available on short notice to be able to reinforce the support uh, any part of the alliance uh, when or if uh, needed. Um, uh, and I expect all allies to contribute to this higher readiness because all allies agreed uh, when we uh, met at our summit uh, last year to have this uh, 430s, this increased uh, readiness. Uh, of course, allies are expected to contribute, uh, uh, as I say, according to their size. Uh, so uh, allies will uh, contribute in different ways, but I expect all allies uh, to contribute. We have, we have already a lot of uh, uh, contributions from uh, many allies, uh, but we still have some, some gaps and, uh, and, and we will continue to, uh, to work on those gaps to make sure that we fill those gaps uh, uh, by the end of the year. Okay. Thank you very much. This concludes this press uh, press conference, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.